Let me welcome to the show. Um, among being a, a powerhouse writer, that's how I met her back in the day, back in the day out in them writing streets. Um, she is the producer of Survivor and R. Kelly. And I believe that that documentary cracked everything that 20 plus years of people talking about it could never do because it, it brought front and center the victims, their parents, the stories. And um, I believe it was the basis for this trial that led to a guilty verdict. Um, let me welcome to the show, Small Case D, Small Case D, Dream, Hampton, welcome. Hi, Karen. Hey. Hi, Dr. Vincent. <laughs> it's an honor to be here on this day. I'm sure your audience has been thinking about this verdict. I, I, I reached out to you yesterday and I was like, you must be bombarded right now. And everybody, everybody is probably reaching out. Where were you when you heard the guilty verdict and what did you feel? You know, I was in the ocean. <laughs> Um, and I have been, uh, my new practice, um, when I run errands or when I make small trips away from the house, less than two hours is to leave my phone in a drawer. And I came home, I was still wet. I was getting ready to take an outdoor shower. And, um, yeah, I had about 40 something messages. <laughs> I was like, something happened. Um, I wasn't expecting this verdict. I wasn't expecting the trial. When we began Surviving R. Kelly in 2018, that's when we started filming it. It had been 10 years since um, R. Kelly was acquitted in Chicago in 2008, um, primarily charged with child pornography. Um, at that time, he was able to manipulate the system. Um, he was charged about six or seven years before. He was able to delay that trial. Um, he was able to keep that uh, victim close to him, a teenage girl thinking that she was in a relationship um, she probably thought he was the love of her life, this 30-something-year-old man who uh, she met when she was 12 and who she was uh, filmed being abused by him when she was 14. Um, he was also able to pay off her parents. This is all in Surviving R. Kelly. We're talking about Sparkle's um, sister and brother-in-law. And um, so he was able to beat those charges. Um, in fact, he met Geronda Pace, uh, one of the people who featured in Surviving R. Kelly and one of the women who testified against him in court in New York over the past five weeks. He met her because she skipped 10th grade. She skipped school to go down to the courthouse as a super fan. So this is a man who in 08, facing child pornography charges, felt so confident about the fact that he was going to get off because he had this victim who was never going to testify against him, that he was cruising high school girls during his trial about child pornography. So I didn't think in 2018 that we were gonna get a new trial from this. And you know, we're talking about a 50 year old R&B singer who hadn't had a hit in a decade. Um, so I had no hopes that this was gonna to lead to anything. I hope that it would be a new cultural reckoning. I hope that we would reconsider because I think there are other ways um, to get justice. Um, in fact, I don't think that we really get justice in the courts, um, but that's another conversation. <laughs> um, and on that page, have you, I'm on that page. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't, if, if for instance, R. Kelly being a victim of uh, abuse himself, um, if we are to imagine, we have this myth about Malcolm, right? Um, being Malcolm X finding himself um, in prison. Um, and, and that becomes a dangerous, it's not a myth. I mean, it's his, it's his autobiography, right? But it becomes a dangerous example because it makes us think that, you know, that prison can be this place where there's like deep learning and spiritual awakening and, and even where one might find one's path because it happened with Malcolm, right? But what happens most of the time in prison is people are further damaged um, and, and abused by that system. And then they come home because more than 90% of people who go into prisons come home um, and they don't come home back into our communities any better than when they went in. Um, so I think about all of those things when I heard the verdict <laughs> to get back to your question. <laughs> What do, what do we do? And I brought, I brought Dr. Von, Von Zent on early because I feel like, I, I felt like we needed healing before. And for me, mm -hmm. R. Kelly, this case was not about R. Kelly. It's about all of us who have, I don't know anyone who does not have a story or somebody in their family that has a story. I don't know anyone that has one 
person away from this kind of not this kind because this is so egregious that it's so ridiculous that it's stunning um that you would think that he wouldn't be held accountable but um you know this is going on right now yala said you know right now somebody is being sexually assaulted a girl or a boy uh somewhere is right now as we're talking how do we start the healing uh of from not just r kelly but the other r kelly's that are out there well again first of all we have to give our children time and space and energy and language. Most kids today grow up, they have stronger thumbs than they have analytical ability or vocabulary because they all have a phone at 10, but they don't know the distinction between being angry and being disappointed because we don't have time. Mm -hmm. We're on the phone. They're in the back of the car looking at the back of our head as we're driving and we're tweeting and they're texting or we're texting and they're tweeting. So we have to get back to that place, uh, Karen, where our children matter more than our job, more than our degree, mm. more than the money we're making, more than whatever it is that we tell ourselves. I have uh, grandchildren that were raised with their mothers and not necessarily in my sphere who don't know who are 12 and 13 and don't know how to set a table because they don't eat dinner at the table. They eat it out of styrofoam box or off paper plate in front of the television. So we have to get back to a place where our children matter, mm. where they matter, and that we can give them a time with them. You know, my mother, when I was 16 and pregnant, my mother took one look at me and knew it because she knew me, you know? She knew me and she could look at me. She said, okay, something's off here. You pregnant? And of course, no, I was a virgin. <laughs> I had not been engaged in sexual activity. <laughs> I was like Mary, <laughs> but she knew it, you know, because she spent time with me. She spent space with me and she had given me a vocabulary, a vocabulary so that I could speak to her. We have to teach our, give our children a vocabulary so that they'll know how to say somebody hurt me. Somebody didn't listen to my no, somebody touched me and, and those kinds of things. So that that's preventative care in terms of healing what has already happened, again, we have to um, be willing to speak about it, whether with somebody else or professional, whether you're doing it spiritually, psychologically, we've got to begin to talk about it and not talk about it to have anybody validate it. You don't need anybody to validate your experience. Your pain needs a witness. It doesn't need anybody to validate it. A witness meaning somebody to hear it. Not somebody to say, yes, it happened. No, it didn't happen. We got to start there. I, I think about um, all of the men that need to have conversations with one another. You know, one of the things that happened um, when people were taking, before the hashtag Me Too, I can remember uh, Feminista Jones uh, using you okay, sis. The, just these hashtags that aggregated stories about sexual abuse and harm. At the same time, we were reading the support, this report that more than 80% of black girls and women have ex, um, experienced some kind of sexual assault in their lives. And here I'm talking about black girls and women because that's what I am and that's what I have. Um, this, it, this doesn't mean that this is something particular to our community, um, but um, so you had all of these women, 110% of women were saying, I've had an experience where I have either been raped or assaulted or harassed. And 0% of men who know somebody who rapes, harasses, or sexually assaults, right? So yes, this question about be on top of your children, but the history of teenagers is that, the, the, is, is what Nyla just said, your 16 year olds will explore. It's how we are hardwired as a species to reproduce, you know? Um, that exploring, I believe should be happening within their peer group, you know? So what's happening amongst these men, you know? Um, I remember, and, and I don't need a celebrity to make these cases. I'm from Detroit. I remember 25 year olds at my prom. I remember when I looked up and a friend that I had had since eighth grade was bringing around a 12th grader. who He was out in front of Martin Luther King High School, picking her up from school. And I remember not talking to him directly because at that point I'm done with you. 
And this is someone I've known since eighth grade because I've already, I knew this man. I know that I can already have the conversation with him. I've been having conversations around patriarchy and misogyny, and misogynoir with men, famous and non-famous my entire life. And I knew that he was a lost case, but I went to our mutual best friend um, who he, who greatly respected and said, are you gonna say anything to him? You know? And he's like, oh man, I, I ain't got time to be messing with, let's just mm. say his name was Jerry. I ain't got time to be messing with Jerry. You know, and so R. Kelly had among around him people on his payroll, but he also had someone like Ron Isley, someone whose music I grew up on. We're talking about the R. Kelly verdict, but we're talking about more than R. Kelly. Yella Van Zandt stuck around and Dream Hampton uh, is here as well. Producer of Surviving R. Kelly. And before we went to break, you were talking about men holding other men accountable. How is it possible that 84, I think is 84 percent of women have had some sort of sexual assault or rape, yet zero percent of men know anyone who's ever raped? How does that how does that jive? I would say if you throw in harassment, I'm going with 110 percent of women. <laughs> OK, OK. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, yeah, you know, I was I was just talking about the one man that we know publicly that R. Kelly had around him that he respected. He didn't have a relationship with his brothers um, and everyone else around him was on his payroll that wasn't um, a woman or a girl. And so, yeah, um, when do, and, and by the way, even these men on, their pay, on the payroll, I wish that they would have intervened. Um, they were charged with things like denying the women food for hours. Um, they would go around and have to take the orders for everyone in the studio and they would know which girls were on punishment who weren't allowed to eat that night, which girls weren't allowed out of the room to use the bathroom, which girls needed a slop bucket in the um, room because they weren't allowed um, to use the bathroom. And so you witness this. Um, obviously, when we talk about rape culture, we talk about, um, you know, and back to Ron Isley, you know, this idea of pimping, you know, um, which we mythologized in hip hop and, which is why, you know, Ron Isley chose that as his, as his way back in, into the 90s. He's been important in every decade that Isley Brothers have. And in the 60s and 70s and 80s, it was about love. And he comes back as, you know, Mr. Big, because that's the culture, you know? Um, so this kind of control over women's bodies, this idea of grooming, um, this isn't just about celebrity, like I said. I wasn't talking about a celebrity when I was talking about my friend from eighth grade who at 30 something was sitting outside of Martin Luther King High School on Lafayette Street in Detroit. What, what do we do with the defense? Um, you know, every now and then we're gonna bring up the case and I get a bank of calls, mostly men, some women saying, well, the women are lying, especially with Bill Cosby, women are lying. And I'm like, what about these girls? And it seems to be, I, I don't know whether there's a disconnect, but a, a defense. And then it gets so ridiculous. We were um, talking about uh, the extreme ways in which people were defending R. Kelly. I think uh, somebody blew up a car of one of the victims. Uh, one of your screenings in December of 2018 had to be canceled after a shooter, active shooter showed up to the, to the, to the event. And mm -hmm. like people are serious in defense of somebody who's a predator. How do, how do we I, navigate that? Yeah, I'd like to say that both of those people were paid by R. Kelly, you know? Um, so, the, you know, the, the person who like called in the, the gun threat to our screening <laughs> used the 312 phone number. I'm like, you are really bad at crime. I could teach you a thing or two, you know? Um, <laughs> so I called from a Chicago cell phone. And so that wasn't hard to trace um, and NYPD got to the bottom of it. And then yes, Azrael Clary showed on Instagram her phone, her car being set on fire and people accused her of doing it herself. And um, later on someone in his, in his um, one of his employees was charged with that um, arson. Um, you know, innocence, um, I can almost see that like, I understand the logic of that when people are talking about Bill Cosby. Um, I believe uh, Bill Cosby's accusers, but I understand the logic of it. There isn't an argument of innocence to be made. Forget the court, you know what I mean? Forget, and, and I'm talking about to people who are my age and older, people who are Gen X and who were up and walking and outside in 2002 when the video of him raping and abusing a 14 year old girl who appeared to be a preteen. She had no hips, no breasts. When that video went viral in the streets, 
when it was at gas stations, when it was at barbershops, when it was all the places y'all know it was, then yeah, don't talk to, now, now that video, by the way, I didn't watch it back then, I had to watch it for this show, is so degraded online on these free porn sites right now, I'm just keeping it real, that you could actually make the argument he tried to make back then, that it wasn't him, it was his brother, right? That you can't tell it was him because it's so degraded in this moment. It wasn't in 2002. So when the boondocks, when Aaron Magruder was making, you know, his, his critical commentary in the way of jokes, when Dave Chappelle was making songs like Piss on You and South Park, when, when, when that particular video became a cultural conversation, um, not to mention all the raps it ended up in, um, there wasn't a question about his innocence. So now you're talking about the tolerance that we have under patriarchy and misogyny law for, and we're not, and, and, and by the way, I'm not acting like we're that removed from it. One of the reasons that Aaliyah may not have been shocking to a lot of us is because we have grandmothers who were 15 when they married our 35 year old grandfather. We don't, you know, this, this is a thing that wasn't unheard of in the South a generation ago. It's not there are very few states in this, um, you know, you had that uh, white senator or, or he's running for Congress, uh, Roy somebody, he didn't win, who was uh, part of that Christian cult movement where you get permission. He was talking about he was cruising teenagers as a 30 something year old lawyer at malls, but he had their parents permission, right? Roy Moore, it wasn't, almost won. Right. Roy Moore, almost wasn't won. Wasn't illegal in Alabama. Exactly. Right. Trump um, went and, and campaigned for him, right? So yes, we can get into the cultural conversation about that, you know? Um, but the reason why um, men want young women is for all the reasons of, around patriarchy, which is around obedience. The reason you groom a young girl, uh, this is tied to virgin culture, you know, while we want to worry about, I'm not saying your audience is, is worried about them, but while the United States wants to have conversations about the safety of girls and, and women in Afghan, um, we can talk about, you know, how that plays out in right here in America. Um, so anyway, for all of those reasons, <laughs> um, we arrive at a point where we're not necessarily shocked, you know, it, 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 him and Aaliyah showing up at BET and talking to Big Les and those matching overalls and outfits was shocking. But we thought, okay, maybe they're in love. He's 20 something, she's 15. It's all wrong, but it's not something we haven't heard of, right? I think about myself, why wasn't I like out with a one, one woman sign protesting that then, right? But what we got in 2000, when Tiffany Hawkins, when we learned about her lawsuit, about her going to the Chicago Police Department saying, you know, in the early 90s, in 91, I was abused by R. Kelly as a minor. And Jim DeRogatis reports that in the Chicago Tribune. Then what begins to become apparent is a pattern of predation. So it's not this one thing where you, you, and I'm not saying that Elvis and Priscilla, that it was the one time Elvis ever slept with a teenager or that Jerry Lee Lewis it was the one time he slept with a cousin or a 12 year old, you know, I have no idea what these men were doing. I don't care about them. I do care about black girls in Chicago and places like Detroit. And what we learned was that he had a predation, that he was up in high schools. So he would go back to his own high school, that he would go to McDonald's. And these are stories that we didn't know. So the question of innocence, is not that interesting to me. What you might honestly want to say is that I don't care about black girls and what happens to them is their own fault or their parents' fault. And you know, you hear that a lot when they was trying to sell their children to their parents. Well, let's talk about men who are out here buying children. You know, I don't think that, for instance, that police, but I don't think that how, we've been protesting forever. You know, we were shutting down the streets for Amadou Diallo, for Abner Louima, um, you know, before that folks, were, you know, and this is Sean going Bell. on. Yeah. Exactly, forever, right? And the numbers that we have from 2021 so far don't sharp, show any fewer police killings um, of black folks, extrajudicial or by the police, right? This isn't gonna change because black people are outraged about it. It's gonna change when there's a change amongst police, you know, um, and policing. So to me, this is a question that men need to be having with themselves. I'm not really actually down to have a lot of conversation. I'm a little too old for, for it to have a conversation about R. Kelly's innocence. Mm. Iyanla, what do we do with the complicity? What do we do with the women who defend? What do we do about the silence in our culture, the, the looking away at, yeah, we all saw age ain't nothing but a number. And we didn't have a problem with that. 
we didn't have a problem. We were bopping to it, you know, and everybody knew she was underage and, and it didn't seem to matter to us. We liked the music. You know, as I said to you earlier, this is some new level living that we're doing. And also that our ancestors are absolutely outraged at the depth and the lack of integrity among us the depth and the lack of compassion, the depth and the lack of accountability, of responsibility. And as Jean said, it's, it's not about going to the police um, all the time or even the courts. There, there has to be a shift in us as people, as individuals and collectively. I remember when I was growing up, um, you know, anything you did on the block, somebody, it got reported. <laughs> by some neighbor behind some blind or some screen and sometime right in the window shaking their fingers. We don't, we don't have that anymore. So there seems to be this collision of, you know, the world and culture and, and requirements because on one hand, we have all the things that Dream said, the lack of accountability, the, our toleration and accommodation of bad behavior because of fame or fortune. You know, fame is the number one drug. But then we also have in 2012, the year that that video came out with, with R. Kelly and the young girl, he got an NAACP Image Award. 2002, yeah. 2002. As a matter of he got the President's Award. He performed at the Olympics, you know. Okay. And then, you know, we talk about we want to protect young women and young girls. And this is no heat, no judgment, no criticism. How do we do that when a beautiful young woman that we watched grow up in front of us is singing WAP? And our young girls are bobbing their head to that. How do we reconcile those things? How do we- Is that the same though? Is that the same? Yeah. Is WAP, the, I, don't I don't think WAP- Yeah, I don't think, I, don't I, I want black oh. women and girls be free, to be free to explore their I do um, too. I do sexuality, too. Yeah, free I of predation. The conversation on the other side. Yes, WAP is a good thing. It's a wonderful, lovely thing. But what's the conversation on the other side about when it's appropriate and how it's appropriate? But well, the we conversation on the other side is, is it would be male rappers. Yes. Um, there are so many. Yeah, so there's a lot of lyrics about that. But before we even get to hip hop, I mean, I always, I always say that I didn't learn that women ain't SHIT, but bitches and hoes from the B side of a Snoop Dogg record. I learned it from the book of Genesis. And so, <laughs> I'm, saying, I'm sorry, I'm Karen. <laughs> I wasn't thinking on that particular artist. I, like I said, beautiful young woman. We watched her grow up, but we've got all of these. Mix but, I th but I think we're conflating because the, the issue here um, is the predator behavior that exists in our community that we turn a blind eye to, which could lend itself to all these other iterations. But we haven't dealt with the root cause, which is a lack of respect for human life, liberty, body, you know, to, to control and own your own body, that these people are being violated, boys and girls, you know, and in our families, in our homes, and we do nothing. And Yana shared a story of telling her aunt, her aunt did nothing. And that story is prevalent uh, so, so I mean, it's our Kelly story. It's our Kelly yeah. story. I mean, and by and this kind of this fantasy of street justice also happened with our Kelly, right? Like, you know, his brother um, for surviving our Kelly told the story about, um, you know, the the man who was molesting um, our Kelly and other boys in the neighborhood, and them kind of beating him down. You know, um, the follow up question: I interviewed all of the survivors in surviving our Kelly and the parents. I didn't go to Chicago to interview his brother, but I would have followed up with. Um, and what did this man stop that behavior, you know? Because I don't know that a beat down is healing, you know? I, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm sure that prison isn't. And I'm not saying that you were saying that's what should happen, Dr. Kinsey. I'm just saying that, that is a, that's his testimony that R. Kelly's brother gave, that there was a man on the block who was yeah. molesting boys and that, and that they went and beat that man up, the men in the neighborhood. Um, R. Kelly was still a boy and so was his brother, but they witnessed the grown men um, holding this man to task, right? No police were involved. Um, but what was but then the conversation with R. Kelly to perpetuate his healing? And that's my point. We've been talking now for over an hour 
And what up uh, when people walk away from this conversation, from their hearing and their being with us, what is it that they do individually or collectively so that we begin to perpetuate this healing? Because just to keep talking about it and raising it, and, and we have to look at all of the aspects. Like I said, I wasn't uh, uh, judging or putting down this one particular artist because like you said, it was in the 90s. It started way back then. And it did start in Genesis, Eve, you know, she's got everybody in trouble. But we, we have to begin to have not only yeah, both Lot's wife is in Eve, everybody. <laughs> Come on. There's, there's a whole lot of problems with the Bible. We could be here all day. The conversation, and we have to leave every conversation. Okay, this is what we got to do. So okay. what, what should want, we do? Is there counseling? To to yes. I want men. I, I talked about peer, you know, like, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about Mike Tyson lately, you know, and Mike Tyson mm. is radically different from R. Kelly, right? Um, R. Kelly had a system in place that became, that escalated after he was found innocent in 08, that became more egregious. He started uh, having women write false confessions. That was something that we talked about in Surviving R. Kelly. And it was again testified in open court under oath by the survivors that he would have them write because what, these are things he learned from having caught a charge. Um, so, you know, just like someone catches a charge and they're like, oh, let me not keep my weight in the trunk. Let me do this. <laughs> Let me put my whatever in coffee or whatever, right? So now he has like a more sophisticated operation, right? Um, so R. Kelly, even though he was a victim of sexual abuse, he was also a very sophisticated predator who had all kinds of, he hired police, off-duty cops who worked for him, who would alert him when parents did things like ask the police department for a wellness check. Um, by the way, people like, why didn't the parents go to the police? They went to the police multiple times. Um, and many of those policemen were working for R. Kelly, right? A cop um, by the last name of Hood testified at R. Kelly's trial, you know? Uh, Jamila King wrote about that in BuzzFeed. Um, but I think about Mike Tyson, who I don't think uh, really truly understood consent. You know, he, uh, when he testified in his defense in Indiana, Joe Morgan wrote about this in the Village Voice. Uh, you know, they said, why? Desiree Washington said no several times. She's in your room at two in the morning, but she said no you know, one syllable word, very clear, more than like a half dozen times. And his response under oath was lots of bitches say no, right? So there's a conversation that is to be had about consent. And, and I don't think that Mike Tyson came out of jail being any clearer about consent. And consent isn't this way that men are like, ah, you gotta tell your son and nephews, get them on videotape and say, yeah, I wanna have sex with you. No, how about like, you actually talk about what consent is, right? And, and the reason I'm talking about Mike Tyson is because when Mike Tyson was in prison, Spike Lee made a trip out to Indiana to visit him. Uh, Farrakhan talked about his innocence. The men that mattered Tupac. to Mike Tyson, Tupac, the men that mattered to Mike Tyson, that Mike Tyson looked up to, that Mike Tyson might have listened to, did not call him in. I'm not talking about calling him out. I'm not saying that Farrakhan should have stood up in Stony Island and, and said, you know, Mike Tyson is a rapist. I'm saying there wasn't a private phone call that was like, brother, I don't care. She is in your room at two in the morning. Maybe, maybe T Farrakhan or any of these people wouldn't care anything about Desiree Washington, but I don't want you to go to jail. So therefore, let me explain to you, because I know all you have was these like, you know, older white men who've been working with you since you were 12, 13, that look at you as a brute. So anyway, I've been thinking about Mike Tyson. And when I think about R. Kelly and I think about this culture, that is telling him that he didn't do anything wrong, that the mothers did something wrong, that the girls did something wrong. You know, they shouldn't, should they not have been in McDonald's? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> at school, should they not have been at school? Right, he was up at Kenwood Academy at his, at his you know, at his high school, cruising girls, you know? Um, and so I, I just think about the very few people that he might have listened to and still might, because there is a healing that needs to happen. And the first thing comes with him understanding the crimes that he's committed, not legal crimes, but crimes against, you know, these, these women, it's going to be, th this verdict didn't bring them healing, for instance, all of them need therapy and they're going to need it. They, some of them have been, they were talking to me about something that happened two decades ago and it was so raw for them. And by the way, all their stories matched and it wasn't because they were friends or Kelly pit women against one another. He would introduce them. And the first time they met, he'd make them have sex with each other on tape. So they hated each other. So the ones who did know each other from the same era, 
But you had women from 99 talking to me, telling me the same story that from women from 2018, except it just got worse. So I don't know. Well, can so I let's get to, to yeah. Because I'm going to have to leave you all in a minute. Yep. For us and everybody listening, I want to say, take a breath. Because we just put out a lot of energy. And I'm sure there are people all over your audience, Karen, who are triggered to no end. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I want to take I'm a sorry breath. about that. No, 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 no. It's, we have to talk about it. And we have to talk about both sides. But I'm not going to leave you all just hanging out there. I'm asking everybody take a breath. Why? Because that is what connects us to the creator. And we're going to inhale and we're going to release. And there are those who are resistant saying that shit don't work and it ain't going to do nothing and blah, blah, blah. So you don't breathe and you stay with the energy. Everybody else, take a breath. And we just release that. We release the energy. We release the memories because we got it like that. We got just that much power. And anything that you heard that did bring up something for you, remember that there's a little person in there. Just let them know, it's okay. Let them know, I got you. I got you and I got this and we can have this conversation and I'm not gonna leave you because I'm sure many people are triggered and we have to have the conversation and we have to know how to talk about it. Then we have to know how to neutralize it so that we can move forward with it, yeah? Thank you. Part, you know what Thank you, you so much. Me. I yeah, love I, you. Thank you. I've got to leave y'all. Yes, but- Iyanla Van Zandt. <laughs> follow her everywhere. The queen, the goddess, and Dream Hampton. I'm going to let you go too because you need to get some sleep. And I don't want to be responsible for another <laughs> another <laughs> moment with you not sleeping. Go get you some rest. Thank you, uh, Karen. And thank, no, thank you for not quitting on those women. Thank you for not giving up. That's what that looks like, y'all, when you don't give up a fight this is not a victory but at least we have some accountability and i appreciate you and i love both of you 